Hey guys, this is Kev Ryan, here with another battle report. This is going to be for IGL Season 7, Round 1. Me as Steel Phalanx versus Varumus as Bakunin Jurisdictional Command on the mission Unmasking. Before getting into this any further, I want to remark that this will be something of a one-sided match in my favor. And because we'll be talking a lot about things my opponent did to make the match, you know, favored for me, I want to give some caveats. Normally, I try to avoid battle reports that focus on my opponent's mistakes, basically because it's really hard to give a fair perspective on things that look like misplays. When I talk about my play, you know, I have the microphone. I know what I did well. If I present a good defense, I can tell you what I was thinking when my opponent's attacks failed to land. Likewise, when I make mistakes, which I do, I can give you the context on why those mistakes happened and what was leading into them. Heck, it took me three videos basically to admit that I played badly in my finals match against Lobo in IGL Season 6. And because I have the microphone, I can be sure that my battle reports give my point of view a fair shake because, well, it's my point of view. But I can't do that for someone else's play. I don't have their point of view. If I see a play that doesn't work, I don't know the context in which my opponent made that play. So I normally try to avoid battle reports that are at a high risk of being unfair in their narrative to my opponent. And this being a one-sided match, I would say it's a high risk of, you know, basically me being unfair. That said, some folks in the Discord said battle reports um, that are one-sided would be educational, and my opponent was generously excited to have a battle report of our game. So, you know, here is that battle report. What I would ask is, Bear in mind that I'm calling things as I see them, and the way that I see things necessarily is only going to be from my perspective. And that perspective is not going to include the context that gives you the whole story. So, yeah. All that discussed, let's dive into the mission. This is Unmasking, definitely one of the more balanced, more fair missions in ITS. In it, each player has three designated targets that they deploy on the field, they secretly record which of the two are decoys and which is the real target to assassinate. And then there are three consoles in the middle of the field, which, if you activate them with a specialist, allow you to ask about one of your opponent's designated targets to say, is this the real one or is this a decoy? Once these guys are revealed, it is now time to go out and kill the designated targets and the decoys. You get three points for killing the real one. You get one point for killing more decoys. You get one point for killing each decoy. You get one or two points for either having the same number of consoles or more consoles activated at the end of the game, and you get two points for keeping your own designated target alive. As a final note, there is an exclusion zone through the middle of the map, which means that everybody's going to have to spend at least some orders moving specialists up to those consoles. I and many others like this mission because it doesn't obviously favor going first or going second. Going first gives you the opportunity to bloody your opponent's nose and also push some consoles and kill some targets. But going second gives you the last laugh in terms of uh, controlling consoles at the end. And the need to potentially push three buttons and then find your way to three designated targets that are put in awkward spots often means that both players are going to have to be spending orders doing stuff other than simply killing each other. The fact that you have to hide three designated targets in the midfield also makes it so this mission favors choosing deployment. Having the better half of the table can really make a big difference in this mission. And that also ends up favoring the person who sort of generally gets to go second. That said, this mission isn't perfect. The most common complaint is that hackers get a bonus. And if you're playing Ariadna, you really don't have any good hackers. For my part, I think the biggest complaint that I have is that there are effectively five points wrapped up in the actual designated target. Three to kill your opponents, two to keep yours alive. So if they kill your target, but you fail to kill their target, they're going to have five points, which means at best you can get a draw. And this is a problem when revealing which target is the real one is, it can be kind of random, essentially. Earlier versions of Unmasking actually had this five points split up a little bit differently. I think you had a data tracker, and killing the enemy's designated target with your data tracker was worth points. So it was less wrapped up in the purity of just killing the designated target, which can be kind of random. And I think I like that version a little bit better. That said, the current version, I think it's the same as in the previous season, and it's still a pretty darn solid mission. I am perfectly happy to see Unmasking in a tournament's lineup. So, yeah, that's the mission. Next up, lists. 
IGL Season 7 was a two-list fixed format event, which means that I basically had to submit two lists into this event and stick to those two lists. This is a small dilemma for me because I don't really know how the Steel Phalanx changes are going to shake up how I play Steel Phalanx. Things are mostly the same, but there are new profiles that change things, and I do want to try to play them. Of course, it's also no fun to have to go through four rounds of an ITS event with a list that turns out to be garbage. So I basically tried to choose the list that I had both the most play experience with, and which I thought was essentially the most conservative list that I had, which still tried out some new profiles. And this is the why not have a GML bot in group 2 list. Now the keen eye among you will notice that there is not in fact a GML bot in group 2. The name comes from the fact that the original version of this list had a TR bot in group 2, and this version of that list trades the TR bot for a missile launcher bot, but the point is, this list does have a group 2 that's full of essentially disposable ARO pieces, and it does have a GML bot. To talk you through what's going on, this is essentially a 2 Inomatarkos big boy style list. Because everything is effectively a Myrmidon link, you actually do have some flexibility in how you set things up. But at a high level, I would say that there are two kind of core ideas of what's going on. The first Inomatarkos is going to be Phoenix, Ajax, and McKayon. You'll slot someone else into that. I have Akmon here, but you could also put in just a regular Myrmidon. The second Enomatarkos is going to be centered around Oideros and Pandora. Oideros has Eclipse Grenades and NCO, and he is a decent long-range gunner, so Oideros doesn't really want to be in the link with Ajax and McKayon. Likewise, Pandora generally, uh, not this particular Pandora because I needed the two points, but Pandora generally is going to have medikits, so Pandora is also happy to stand away from McKayon. There's also a minor point, but if I am going second, I don't want Pandora in the link with McKayon, because if somebody tries to spotlight and kill McKayon, I want Pandora to be able to hack back and defend him. Into this loose Anomatarkos, I tend to put the Myrmidon Officer and Akmon, it's a good idea to keep your Myrmidon officer chain of command away from your lieutenant. And of course, Akmon has tactical awareness, which is nice and is an engineer and thus can fix Oideros. Fixing Oideros is a lower priority, all things considered. Oideros has structure, but he doesn't have remote presence, so you can't re-roll the engineering attempts. So me putting Akmon with Oideros has more to do with the fact that I want tactical awareness in with Oideros' NCO so I can have a 12-order attack run than it does actually being able to fix the guy. But all else being equal, if you take that breakdown, then the way that things tend to be sussing out is I have an Anomatarkos with Oideros, Myrmidon Officer, Pandora, and Akmon, and then I have a more defensive, pure Myrmidon team of McKayon, Ajax, Phoenix, and then a random Myrmidon. On top of that, I have a Samek Missile Launcher bot. This is because Pandora can walk out, shoot pitchers near my opponent, and then spend orders, move spotlighting people in order to move the link around and, you know, potentially set them up for a missile getting dropped on their head. It's not something I'm regularly going to do, and I personally as a player don't have a lot of experience with knowing when it is order efficient to try to guided missile something, but it is something that's nice to have around. Along with that, I have a probot. I have found that it is very nice to be able to recharge Pandora's uh, pitcher because I often shoot them somewhere dumb. The Corsair Bashi Bazook is just the free Bashi Bazook for those missions that have it. Unmasking is not one of them. And then group two is basically just three flash pulses. The two Lameds are flash pulse bots. They're also deployment zone repeaters, which is nice. And uh, in principle, I could even run them up and be repeaters and then hack with Pandora. And then of course the humble war core is there because sometimes you just need your war core to crit the enemy Rambo. And you know, that'll happen nine times out of 10. So all told, I think this is one of the more conservative variations on the big boy lists that I've been running. I am using Orderos, which is a new piece. I am using Pandora, which is a new piece. I'm using the Samic Missile Launcher, which is somewhat new to me. But ultimately, this is a two Enormantarkos big boy style list, and we're not going to get too much difference from that core archetype. Here then is an approximation of my opponent's list. As you can see, it's at 301 points, so I didn't get it exactly right. And I also wasn't sure on the groupings, but this sketch includes enough for us to actually talk about what's going on. So what is going on? Well, in group one, you have the fairly standard Riot Girl core with Avicenna and Fiddler. Avicenna and Fiddler both count as Riot Girls, so you get this to be a pure link. That is really, really good. It is 
frankly, absurdly good in this environment in which you just have so few pure bonuses that are out there. And it is such an obvious pick that I'm in no way to surprised to see my opponent running that core as part of his link. Frankly, the only variation is whether you take the Riot Girl with a boarding shotgun in the tin bot or maybe something else. One other thing that's going to be relevant against Steel Phalanx is that the Riot Girls all have MSV1. This isn't going to cut all the way through our Mimetism minus six, but it does mean that someone like Phoenix can't smoke dodge in ARO in order to stay safe from the Riot Girls. The other three pieces I've put into group one are a Moderator Paramedic, a Reaction Zond, and a Morlock. I don't recall if these were the exact three pieces that were in group one, but I do know that my opponent did an eight plus seven split. I, I think the eight was with the Riot Girls, it might have been seven, but we definitely did not go with a traditional 10 plus five. The moderator could be a spare link member for the Riot Girls. He's not going to be able to, you know, core up with them in a pure fashion, but having another guy in there can be nice. The Reaction Zond is just generally nice to have, especially when you have an engineer like Zoe in Group 2, and the Morlocks are, of course, wonderful. My opponent did choose the Assault Pistol Morlocks. That is not the most common pick. Most people choose the EMCCW Morlocks. But in a mission like Unmasking, if you reveal a designated target and the only thing nearby is a Morlock, then the Assault Pistol actually has more ability to kill that thing by shooting at it than you would if you normally just had a pistol. Sure, you'd probably be even better off walking in and CCing, but that can just be a little bit less efficient and you can get really annoyed if the HVT passes every single dodge and just, you know, ducks and rolls away from you as you try to get close and CC it. So I don't hate the Assault Pistol inclusion here, I just want to call it out as being a little different than normal. Group two, you have Zoe and Pywell. Pywell is the FTO option here, but that just means that he is a regular instead of a sink. He's not actually going to be part of a team. Now, in ITS-14, Pywell being a bot with a repeater and FO is going to get tactical awareness and marksmanship, which frankly is mind-boggling to me. Pywell is really, really good, and in the Steel Phalanx update, they gave him the ability to join Lynx, and they gave him this pitcher. These seem like really big buffs to a unit that was pretty good to begin with. And we really have not had enough time since the Steel Phalanx update to determine if Pywell needed yet more buffs in order to be playable. But, you know, maybe the team that does army updates is different from the team that does ITS updates. And, you know, perhaps that's why Pywell gets these two buffs in rapid succession. I don't know. Suffice to say, though, that I think Zoe and Pywell are pretty close to auto-include as well. Next, we have a Meteor Zond. This also has tactical awareness and marksmanship, but because it is a drop troop sensor bot, basically, it's not going to generate the tactical awareness order while it's off the board. I don't love the Meteor Zond, but I also don't hate it, and getting marksmanship for free is definitely going to make this thing a better piece in general. Next up is the Chimera, the Uberfall Commando. These guys are awesome. The only thing I will say is that as awesome and deadly as they are, they can be order hungry. And as we can see, they've been put in a group that only has seven regular orders, or sorry, seven total orders, two of which are irregular. And one of them is actually going to be from the Meteor Zone, which is not going to be on the table at deployment. So this lack of orders will make it harder for the Uberfall Commando to really tear me apart. Other than that, we have another Morlock with Assault Pistol. I don't mind having the Morlock split into separate groups. It gives you smoke in either group. And then you have two moderators, one of which is the Lieutenant, the other is the Lieutenant decoy option. So this is very roughly the list. It has the standard Riot Girl core. It has an 8-7 split. It has Zoe and Pywell, because why wouldn't you have Zoe and Pywell? It has the Uberfall Commando, because again, why wouldn't you have the Uberfall Commando? The only slots I would say that are um, sort of flex spot slots in this style of list uh, have been filled with the Meteor Zond and with the Reaction Zond. Having talked about the list, let's go ahead and talk about deployment. My opponent won the die roll and decided to go first. Wanting to go first seems like it's pretty common these days. I am actually personally of the opinion that going first tends to be favored unless you're doing a mission that really is favored for going second. And I think my opponent's thinking on this issue is that if you get to go first, then you get the chance to act, um, whereas if you go second and you just get alpha struck off the table, then you don't even get to do anything. That being said, the question of going first versus going second is something that IGL is trying to answer. One of the things you have to check when you submit your results is, did you get to go first? Or maybe it's, did whoever won go first? Well, whatever the wording of the question, 
Um, suffice to say that this is something that people are asking uh, that IGL is collecting data on. And while I am uncertain about whether the data that they're collecting is going to convince me one way or the other on whether going first is favored or not, suffice to say that my opponent won the die roll and did choose to go first. And their thinking, which I believe is sound, is that getting to go first means you actually get to do stuff and that gives you an advantage. Of course, that means that I get to deploy second and I get to choose which deployment. I had a tough call of deployment on this map. I felt like the far zone, which is the one that I ended up picking, I felt like that far zone was better for deployment but had worse HVT spots. And I did ultimately settle on choosing the deployment zone with better deployment options, which left my opponent in this situation. Um, he had his Riot Girl core over here. This is the tin bot. Um, I think we removed the tin bot shortly after deployment because nobody needs to drag it around. You have the two moderator lieutenant options. This is Zoe. This is the TR bot. This is the moderator paramedic. Um, this is the Uber fall commando. They were the withheld piece. And then I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe there is a Morlock and Pywell stuffed into here. And then another Morlock on this position. In terms of HVTs, my opponent's HVTs are here, here, and here. Um... And my opponent, I think, has done their best to have a reasonable spread of specialists with access to firepower or smoke and with access to the consoles. So Pywell is going to be able to use this group two orders to run up and push, I think, this button. I can't remember if it's this button or the other one, but it'll run up and push a button. And then the Riot Girls are going to be able to swing around in this direction and push another button. And then the Morlocks or the Uberfall Commando will run in and kill the designated targets. That is at least um, what this deployment is kind of suggesting to me. Meanwhile, this is my deployment. In group two, I had the Lamed flash pulse bot here, Lamed flash pulse bot here, and then the war core is on the stairs over that way. The idea here is that there is not a lot of ways to get access to most of my troops, which are in this sector. And what I want is I want my opponent's Riot Girls to have to go through repeater coverage in order to get there. If they make the long run over in this direction, then I've got this repeater. And if they make the run in this direction, then again, this repeater is going to stop them. On top of all this, there is actually a long line of fire from this flash pulse spot all the way, I think, that way, um, which is going to prevent an attack on this direction unless they throw a smoke or otherwise have to deal with the flash pulse spot. Other than that, I have two Enomatarkos that I've basically tried to stuff into this corner. The first Enomatarkos is a pure core. Um, it has Ajax here, Myrmidon here, Mikaeon there, and then Phoenix was my withheld piece, but then I, you know, I, I thought that he would probably get dropped there, and I did in fact end up dropping him there. The other one has the Myrmidon officer here, the uh, Pandora here, Oideros, there, and then Akmon. I took a lot of time trying to find a good spot for Akmon. I just couldn't find one, so Akmon's actually up here. It's a little bit annoying because he'll have to walk all the way down this building, but, you know, he's got he's got tactical awareness. He'll make it there. My thinking with the deployment of this second Enomatarkos, by the way, is that these guys with their Eclipse Grenades are something like my best option to stymie the Riot Girl attack. So if my Riot Girls come around the corner and they see, for example, this Myrmidon Officer, or they see, for example, Oideros, then I can smoke dodge two dice on 16s with Eclipse, and if I win, then I completely shut off the attack. Meanwhile, my opponent is attacking either with a Missile Launcher, which is only going to be burst two. Um, it will be on flats because they have plus three for the link, minus three for my, my Mimetism. Um, but they're only going to be on flats, and I'm going to be advantaged, and if I win, I completely shut down the attack. So these guys are on aggressive ARO. Meanwhile, Phoenix is just kind of standing here because I think my opponents are going to come around this corner. Phoenix is reasonably dangerous. Um, you know, he's going to be on flats. They're going to shoot him on flats maybe with a missile launcher. It's very literally rocket tag. But I kind of figure that if I get lucky, I can potentially just shut down his whole core the entire game. And if I get unlucky and lose Phoenix, it's not the end of the world. Other than that, I have my Missile Launcher bot here. The Missile Launcher bot is actually watching this lane. Again, I want my opponent to have to have stuff to think about as they walk through here. The Missile Launcher bot is very sturdy. Um, it'll probably go unconscious, but Akmon is upstairs. Um, and it's dangerous enough that they have to stop to fight it. And then I've got the Probot up here, both to reinforce Pandora's pitchers and to be another repeater. So that's my deployment. Compared to normal big boys, 
Uh, what I will say is that there are an awful lot more models that I have to stuff in various places. I feel like with my normal big boy list, where you really just have the big boy Nomatarkos, Achilles, Hector, and then a couple of flashball spots and net rods, I feel like that would have been really easy for me to stuff into this corner very, very defensively. But um, that's not the list that I have. I have a list that has really just a handful of more troops. But the fact that it has a handful of more troops means that it's just that much harder in order to actually hide them all in one corner. So it's a little bit more awkward to deploy. The solution I came up with, I think, is, is basically fine. Using this building is a huge boon, but it's something I wanted to be careful of. Going back to this picture, I am going to talk about the game. Given that my opponent had eight orders in group one and I think six orders in group two, it was a question on how I wanted to spend my command token. On the one hand, I wanted to restrict the Riot Girls. On the other hand, I wanted to restrict the Uberfall Commando. And what I decided to do was strip one order from each of them. That's a little bit odd, but I think it worked out in the long run. Thus, with both order pools reduced, the first thing my opponent was going to try to do is activate the Riot Girl team and then basically push it up in this position. Of course, if he goes that way, then he has to see Phoenix. And my opponent noticed that the Riot Girl missile launcher from the top of the stairs here could actually see Phoenix here, and that would be further away and thus more likely to be out of range. Before going into this, I want to talk about the lineup just a little bit. The Riot Girl is going to be shooting on burst 2 on flats, essentially, because of my mimetism and range. Meanwhile, I will either be shooting back on 13s, which is the same as the Riot Girl, if we're in 32 inches, or I'll be on 7s if we are outside of 32 inches. A heavy rocket launcher is damage 14, it has continuous damage, and, and this is really important, it has a template. What that means is that if Phoenix wins the face-to-face, -face, there is a not insignificant chance that I will kill something. Armor 3 is good, and failing two saves in a row on Armor 3 is fairly unlikely, but it's not outrageous, especially if, for example, I crit. And when it comes down to burst 2 versus burst 2, especially if the ballistic skill are the same, but also just in general, um, there's a lot of variation in how that can happen. All that being said, if my opponent can absolutely dumpster Phoenix on the first order of the game, I will be out the order that he generates, and I will be out the extremely good arrow piece that he is. So taking this gunfight, especially from a position that is much more likely to be outside of good range, I think that's favored. Unfortunately, there is a downside to the exact way my opponent does it. The problem is, is that as my opponent climbs up the stairs, or rather the ladder, I'll be able to hit him with a template. And because the template will extend in all directions, uh, my understanding, and I suppose I could be wrong, but I don't think I am, uh, but my understanding is that the template will then extend down and potentially hit this Riot Girl and this Riot Girl. Now, I did point this out to my opponent, and we talked about whether we wanted to play it or if he wanted to, like, shuffle those guys around, and he said, no, let's just play it. Um, we'll see what happens, and indeed, that's what's going to happen. So what happens is that the Riot Girl missile launcher gets up there, shoots at Phoenix, wins the face-to-face, -face, and kills him. He fails, uh, I think he fails all three saves, but he really only needed to fail two to die. On the other hand, Phoenix rolls two dice on sevens. One of them hits. I think I rolled like a four or something like that. And because it hit, that's going to force saves on both of these two people that are downstairs, which is the Riot Girl with the boarding shotgun and the Riot Girl with the Spitfire. The boarding shotgun tanks the first save and is fine. The Spitfire fails three saves in a row and goes straight to dead. And that really is a very happy trade for me. Not only is the Riot Girl no longer a pure five-man core, we've also lost the Spitfire, which is the most effective active turn gun. And when I say lost, the Spitfire is straight dead. Avicenna's right there, so if it had merely been unconscious, Avicenna could have picked the Riot Girl back up, they could have reformed the team and gone on their way with fewer orders and fewer command tokens. But no, the Riot Girl really did uh, completely die. And from this death, I think we can learn a couple of things about this engagement. The first thing that I'd like to point out is that the risk to the Riot Girl and to the Tinbot boarding shotgun was completely unnecessary. If my opponent intended for the Riot Girl missile launcher to climb up the stairs and see me, which I think, given the position of the Riot Girl missile launcher, is a good guess, and it frankly was a line of fire that I didn't see, I was expecting them to come around this way, but if that was the intent, then my opponent really should have had the Riot Girl Spitfire and the Riot Girl Boarding Shotgun and probably the Riot Girl Missile Launcher, they should have all started prone. If they had all three started prone, the Riot Girl Missile Launcher could have stood up, climbed up to the top, 
get shot no problem, but the prone Riot Girls on the ground would have been able to stay prone, and being prone, maybe by being more circuitous in their route, could have easily avoided Phoenix's heavy rocket launcher template arrows. So if you're watching, one of the lessons here is that when you're deploying, you should be thinking about template AROs because deploying prone would have made it so that the active player could avoid getting clipped at all by Phoenix's heavy rocket launcher template AROs. The second lesson here is that we need to be very careful about blaming dice. Now, this is not something my opponent did, but it would have been very easy for someone to say, hey, Phoenix is shooting burst two on sevens, and it's only damage 14, and I'm armor three, and I have two wounds. Wow, it's really unlucky that I would get hit in the first place. There's only about a 50-50 shot that you get hit at all. And secondarily, having been hit, it's really unlucky that I fail three saves and die. It is very much true that my opponent got unlucky by failing three saves and dying. But... Blaming the dice, blaming your luck, misses the point that this was an unforced error. This was a risk my opponent didn't need to take in the first place. And in my opinion, it was that unnecessary risk, rather than the bad luck, which led to um, the rack roll getting burned. To dwell on this just a tiny bit further, I will remark that even if my opponent had this deployment you know, with them standing, with the exposure to Phoenix's heavy rocket launcher template, they still could have coped with the situation. And what they could have done is they could have simply spent one order shuffling everyone around prone, or maybe even not prone, first before taking the shot. Having realized that getting shot up here would cause these two riot girls to get clipped, my opponent could have simply spent one extra order, moved people around, dodge that issue, and then on the next turn, take the gunfight with the missile launcher, kill Phoenix completely safely, and move on. It would cost an extra order, and that's a little bit annoying, but it would allow you to avoid this unnecessary risk. And in a game like Infinity, where things are generally so fragile, especially up against continuous damage templates, I think that extra order to avoid the unnecessary risk is generally a good idea. Now to give Veramu's credit, he did realize that it was not a good thing to get clipped by the heavy rocket launcher, and he decided to do it anyway to see what could happen and to see what could be learned from it happening. And if this commentary that I've just given has been useful to you, it is in some senses because Veramos decided to do this to see what would happen, and hopefully it has led to some stuff that we've learned. While I consider the play to be an unforced error on the part of my opponent, I'm not saying that my opponent was unaware of that fact, but rather was sort of interested in seeing what we could learn from it and interested in learning why that was sort of an unforced error as opposed to, you know, a, a risky but maybe worthwhile play. Hopefully that thinking gives a fair shake to my opponent's perspective. Oh, the other thing that happened is that um, as Phoenix was dying and getting shot, the Riot Girl also was able to see Oideros. There was no way to slice the pie here because you're coming up the stairs or up the ladder or what have you. But this does mean that Orderos was able to throw Eclipse Smoke, he threw it right there, and this means that there is absolutely no way that my opponent is going to be able to shoot McKeon, my lieutenant, and kill him on turn one. It also keeps Orderos safe, which was, again, important. With that smoke down, there isn't all that much that this Riot Girl core is going to be able to shoot, and so I believe what they do with the remainder of their orders is basically just wander out to here and push this button and then set up in something of a defensive position over on this angle. I'm not sure if he did that immediately after spending the order to shoot Phoenix, but that is what they do in general. On the other side of the board, um, there are the Morlocks, and then there is Pywell, and their plan is to run up and push a button. So the Morlock here activates impetuously and moves forward, and in my opponent's deployment, there was actually a line of fire all the way from my deployment zone to see that Morlock, and I put Pandora watching that line of fire. I could have put a more dangerous piece, but I chose to put Pandora there because Pandora is able to arrow and throw pitchers. I especially throw one pitcher, I think, underneath here, and then another pitcher over here. Remember that at the time of Impetuous activations, I'm still worried about these Riot Girls, and my thinking is that these pitchers are going to, you know, potentially slow down the Riot Girls. The Morlock advances, the Morlock throws smoke unopposed and succeeds, and the pitchers that I throw don't turn out to be valuable in the scope of the game. But there is still a lesson to be learned here, and the lesson to be learned is that my opponent didn't need to give me the free opportunity to throw pitchers, or maybe I put someone with a gun there and shoot the Morlock. 
the Morlock should not have been deployed in a fashion where he has any line of fire to my deployment zone, because if you put models where there's line of fire to your opponent's deployment zone, then they can deploy troopers in the spots that see those models, and in that sense, give your opponent the opportunity to set the tempo of the battle. I used that tempo to throw some pitchers, which wasn't really a big deal, but in general, uh, I think it matters. Anyway, after the smoke was thrown, I think, covering this position with the Morlock, Pywell ran up. Um, now, as I described this to you, I think one of these two pitchers must have failed because Pylo is hackable, and I didn't get a chance to hack Pywell, um, so I think the closer pitcher failed. But anyway, Pywell runs up using his tactical awareness order and using all the other stuff to run up and push the button on the console. Pywell ends up getting unlucky and fails the button push, I think, two or three times in a row. He's only whip 13, so failing two or three times in a row is um, unlucky, but not outrageously unlucky. And I don't really have too many comments on this. I mean, at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do if you have to push a button and it's going to be burst one. The one piece of advice I will give is that as Pywell was sitting there pushing the button, um, my opponent left Pywell in silhouette contact with the console. Now, Pywell is 6'4", and after he pushes the console, he probably doesn't want to stand there sitting next to it. So what you can do, if you're worried about failing, is instead of having Pywell stand right next to the console, you can have him move half of his first movement speed, which is three inches away from the console. Then if you fail, on further orders, he can run up three inches to touch the console and push the button, and then run back. That trick allows you to get just a little bit more mobility out of the situation. It's not necessarily the, um, the best thing that you can do. I mean, sometimes you want to stay in contact with the thing. Sometimes you want to just be able to run six inches away, and if you get unlucky, then oh well. But I thought I'd bring it up because one thing your specialists can do if you're expecting to fail a button push is you can move half your movement speed away, and then you're just a little bit further away from the button when you do succeed. Anyway, Pywell, he spends three orders pushing the button. He does succeed in the end and reveals another one of my targets. At this juncture, my opponent is mostly out of orders, but not entirely. And what he chooses to do with his few remaining orders is move troops into the midfield. The Uberfall Commando move up into, I think, this position, and the Morlock over here runs up into that position. At face value, this may seem like a reasonable thing to do because it takes these fast attack pieces and puts them into a position where they are closer to being dangerous. However, at this stage of the game, considering how many orders I'm going to have in my order pool and considering how dangerous Steel Phalanx is, moving these pieces into the midfield is actually just getting them closer to where I can go kill them. The lesson I would give is do not move your troopers into the midfield unless you have a plan for what they're going to do. If you have to move through the midfield to kill stuff in their deployment zone, that's fine. If you have a safe spot where you want to tuck someone, and that spot really is safe and it'll be better positioned for them next turn, again, that's fine. I'm not saying avoid ever leaving troopers in the midfield, but you need to be aware that leaving troopers in the midfield is going to expose them to more risk from your opponent's retaliation, and if you don't have a good reason for that risk exposure, it can be a bad idea. Verimus was quickly aware of this. I think he remarked at the end of his turn one that he should have moved his TR bot up instead of moving, I think, the Uberfall Commando up. So this lesson that I am imparting to you, dear viewer, is not one which is, you know, unknown to Verimus the player. It's just something that we can talk about in the context of this battle report that might be worth learning from. The last thing I want to talk about about my opponent's turn one is the fact that it highlights the inherent randomness of unmasking. My opponent pushed two buttons, which means that they reveal two designated targets. My opponent chose this designated target and this designated target, and while I did have Phoenix on ARO, and I actually had a fairly aggressive ARO profile uh, considering the way I like to play usually, I would not have been able to stop him from killing these guys if he really had set his mind to killing them. And killing those designated targets would have been a huge, effectively five point swing in my opponent's favor. Now, as it would happen, this one and this one were both fake. My real designated target was over here. And if you're looking at that position and thinking, what's going on with that? Well, I, I frankly was being at least a little bit cheeky, but to the extent that I was trying to do something that I sincerely thought would be good, um, my opponent didn't actually have any pieces over on that side of the board which could kill the designated target aside from the Morlock. 
And at the time of putting him there, I was thinking, well, Morlocks, you know, they've got chain rifles, they've got pistols, but they actually have to get into melee in order to kill the guy. And I can have a work war and other pieces watching my designated target, which means that I can stun the Morlock. And if I stun the Morlock, then the Morlock can't kill the designated target. So maybe that's okay. Compared with the other two positions that I've chosen, here and here, I mean, these guys are both very exposed if the Riot Girls get to this position and they could just shoot both of them along this lane. So while I was at least partly being cheeky, there was some solid thinking to making this be the real one. And as it would happen, that thinking did pan out. But the flip side of this is that it is essentially bad luck that my opponent pushed two buttons and did not get the real designated target. That is effectively a five-point advantage that I have earned through nothing other than the fact that my opponent guessed wrong on the designated targets. And the presence of this unearned advantage through essentially getting lucky is my biggest criticism with the mission unmasking. Anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up. As if to prove the point about how easy it would be for my opponent to kill my designated targets, let's take a look at this picture. This comes from the end of my opponent's turn one. Um, what he has done is he has taken the Morlock and run him up in order to attack this hamburger or gyro sandwich, uh, HVT. I did get lucky and the gyro sandwich managed to roll behind the building. But if you look at his position behind the building, you'll actually notice that there's this long line of fire along here in which both of them could get strafed. And I am quite sure that if one or both of these had been my actual real designated target, I guess it couldn't be both of them, but if one of them had been my real designated target, it would have been really easy for the Riot Girls just to line up here and then mow the real one down. As it stands, it cost the Morlock some extra orders and the fact that it went unconscious in order to put my designated target unconscious. That's just because I got lucky on the Dodgers or something like that. But hopefully the exposure that these two HVTs are currently in highlights why this position actually turns out to be maybe smarter than the dumb joke that it might have looked like at the beginning. I mean, I'm probably only saying that because my opponent didn't guess that one, but, you know, who knows. Oh, this picture does remind me that one of the things my opponent did as a last move is bring the Meteor Zond onto the table. Meteor Zonds are kind of interesting, as we've already mentioned, they have marksmanship, but they're not great in unmasking because the exclusion zones mean that there's really only a tiny strip where they can join. They can like walk on here, like here, I think, and then the mirror sides. Um, and then other than that, they really can't walk on anywhere without having to drop and their fizz isn't that good. So uh, this is where the Meteor Zone walks on. I think he takes some shots at my Myrmidon officer. I don't really remember, but um, not much happens other than that it appears. So here is the situation at the start of my turn one. My opponent has pushed this button and revealed but not killed the Jason HVT. My opponent has pushed this button and he has revealed and killed the Gyro Sandwich HVT at the cost of his own Morlock. And other than that, I would describe the current situation as a target-rich environment for Steel Phalanx. A lot of troopers have been moved into the midfield, as we've already mentioned. The Uberfall Commando are right there. The Riot Girl Corps is over in this position. There is a Morlock that got moved up to there, a Stempler's on here, and then Pywell is tucked over to there. Pywell's position there is a little unlucky because, you know, he failed the button push so many times, but the major takeaway is that there is, in fact, a lot of stuff in the midfield. And as Steel Phalanx, I absolutely have the ability to punish that. I didn't take any screenshots in the middle of the engagement, but this is the aftermath, and I'll talk you through it pretty quickly. I basically took the Oideros and Omotarkos with Pandora and the Myrmidon Officer and Akmon, and I ran it along this direction, killing everything in sight. I killed the Stemplers on pretty easily with the Myrmidon Officer. Even if the Stemplers on had hit the Myrmidon Officer and wounded him, he's got NWI, and I don't really care that much about him. I then swung around to this position. I saw the Morlock and killed it. I saw Pywell and uh, again used the Myrmidon Officer with his you know, burst three boarding shotgun in order to drop Pywell. And then I ended up along this position and I had a ton of orders left. I had to think carefully about what I wanted to do. Priority target was the Uberfall Commando. They're still really deadly. What I was able to do is use Oideros from, I think like this position, get a bead on the Chimera and shoot it. 
Chimera smoke dodge is on a 16, but I'm shooting myself burst four on 16. I win, the Chimera gets taken out. Next up, I want to throw um, some smoke and push a button. Actually, that's not right. The next thing I did was draw a line of fire from approximately this position into Fiddler first, then the Riot Girl boarding shotgun. And I took out Fiddler, that broke the core. I then took out the Riot Girl boarding shotgun. I only put it unconscious, I didn't kill it. But again, that's two orders that have been taken out. Then I throw the smoke in order to stop the Riot Girl missile launcher from seeing, and I push the button. That reveals a designated target. Remember that there are two designated targets here and here. Um, and then I run around to this position. I actually swing wide and take out a moderator paramedic there. The thinking of taking out the paramedic is that it's just another order. And after all that, I end up in this fairly defensive position along here with my opponent. Uh, basically, really, the core has been reduced to a missile launcher, an unconscious boarding shotgun, and Evachenna. I haven't done much to actually achieve my mission objectives at this point, but the fact that I don't even have to kill his real designated target in order to win the game has allowed me to play it more safe. So rather than going ham and trying to push more buttons and get more kills, I instead try to strip orders and prioritize staying safe. And that's what I do. I have basically stayed safe. My opponent's turn, he's more or less out of options at this point. I've killed a lot of his stuff. But he is not down for the count. He is still trying to think, how can I win the game? How can I get points? What he does is he brings back his Riot Girl, he brings back his uh, Missile Launcher, he brings back Avicenna. They run over to this position to try to shoot at Jason. Jason miraculously survives, and then they move up and push the button, revealing my actual designated target as the real one. This screenshot, I think, is actually from the end of my turn two, but more or less what happens on my turn two is I now am in a fairly advantaged position, and what I need to do is guarantee that I'm going to win the game. I need to do some button pushing, basically. So I've already pushed this button. I can walk in and kill the designated target from that one. As I walk and kill the designated target, I also am throwing smoke in, on this button, running up and pushing this button, and then killing the other designated target in this position. Because my real designated target is alive, I don't care that these guys are probably fakes. I want to kill them for the points, and I want to push the buttons for that as well. That all done, I then leave um, Oideros and the Myrmidon officer in Eclipse Smoke, staring at the majority of his team. If he spends an order activating his team, I'm going to be able to put lots of templates onto them, and that is going to be very dangerous. And at this point, I am okay spending Orderos and my Myrmidon Officer in order to basically eliminate the last of my opponent's serious pieces. What ends up happening on my opponent's turn three is he activates the Boarding Shotgun Riot Girl and puts, I think, three templates on both Orderos and the Myrmidon Officer. For my part, I respond by shooting back, and I knock out the Riot Girl, um, and I think I managed to get a template angle and put a wound on Evachenna. I don't remember if I am able to get that uh, in this moment or not, but um, as we can see, Evachenna's wounded, so something must have happened. That breaks the core. Avicenna's really the only one left, and my opponent does not have the orders in order to get over there. Um, I don't remember if he tries to make a play on Jason, but I, I still have this Innomatarkos that's in the way, and at this point, I've moved my Flash Pulse bots up, so my Flash Pulse are also watching this position. Moving to later screenshots, um, I am basically guessing from the absence of Avicenna that what happened is Avicenna did try to run around here and kill the Jason designated target for the points. I believe Jason survives somehow, um, maybe he passes his dodge, but Avicenna is really, it's just a combi rifle, and I, you know, had cover during some of that, and if he's unconscious, then McCann could potentially doctor him, so it's not a hugely unlikely thing that Jason would have survived. It is, you know, still fairly likely to Jason get taken out, but, you know, at this point, there aren't that many options left, and Jason is the point that's available, so it's good that my opponent went for it. And with Evachenna making that play, the game is basically over. I still need to push this button in order to reveal the true designated target if I want a 10-0. But there is a Riot Girl missile launcher in the way. And I could potentially lose an awful lot of points trying to face-to-face -face that Riot Girl missile launcher if I get unlucky. And those army point losses, you know, might hurt even more than actually getting the full 10-0 victory here. So because I had already won the game at the start of my turn three, I basically, you know, said, I'm not going to do anything with my turn three, and we called it there. 
Actually, that's not fully true. I did try to flash pulse his Riot Girl with this flash pulse bot, and the Riot Girl got knocked unconscious in the process. So even though the whole point of me doing nothing on my turn three is to keep army points alive, um, I still did manage to lose seven points for no reason. So with that seven point loss, I think the game really does end. Anyway, to summarize, this did end up being, I think, a fairly one-sided match in my favor. But I hope the discussion of why that happened ends up being useful to you as you're watching this. Specifically, my opponent having a 8-7 split meant that neither the Riot Girls nor the Uberfall Commando really had the steam to get at me and do serious damage. And this was coupled with a couple of cases where either through bad luck or unforced errors or a combination of the two, that reduced assault was yet further blunted. We talked about why that initial face-to-face -face with Phoenix was an unforced error, and how through either better deployment or spending an order shuffling around we could have reduced the risk of that. And we talked about what I think is the bigger concern, which is that my opponent left a lot of pieces in the midfield where I was able to basically pick them apart. The combination of those two factors, coupled with the fact that my opponent did not successfully kill my designated target, which itself was kind of analogous to bad luck, um, those combination of factors led to the game ending up being one-sided in my favor. I do want to remark that Veramus was very much aware of a lot of the stuff that we've talked about as it was happening. So while I am glad to have the opportunity to use this battle report as a case study to highlight mistakes that um, were made and can be learned from, um, I don't think Veramus needs me to make a battle report out of it to learn from them. He was very much learning from these on the fly as they were happening, which in my opinion is really the, a good sign that someone is on track to be a really good Infinity player. So to both you guys in the audience and also to Veramus, um, thanks for the game, thanks for watching, and I'll see you around.